Ish. How are you doing? Hello. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Steve Mariner, and this morning I'm the host with The Least. And uh, I would like to introduce everybody on the stage for you. This is the Harp Benders panel. Um, before we get to the harp players themselves, we have a wonderful rhythm section of Tony D on the guitar from Monkey Jump. On the bottom on the bass, Mark Garabian. And on the drums, Ephraim Lowell. So we're going to put these gentlemen through the paces and uh, just ease on into something. But uh, our illustrious guests range from New Orleans to San Francisco to Toronto, both of us. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what we love about. I, I thought you didn't you live. I thought you live in San Francisco. Where did I get that? Last year you flew in from San Fran, didn't you? Yeah, but I'm a southern boy. There you go. This is born in Alabama. This is the deep south of Georgia, Georgia, the far north. And then I ended up in Tennessee. Excuse me. That's where I live. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Hall. Yeah! Wake up! This right here is Paul Reddick. First time in Vegas. Hello. The one and only Johnny Sanson. But the wise Sanson. But the wise Sanson. He gives it a name. Because I am a Sanson. <laughs> maybe we'll get to that, maybe not. Um, so before we do some talking, why don't we do a little plan and just. Get into a nice little groove here. Um, How about Key of A, gentlemen? It's, uh, it's the Canadian key, of course. <laughs> <laughs>
So with this, gen this group of gentlemen up here, I, I am a, a fan myself and would like to know little bits of information. So Johnny, would you mind starting us off with the, uh, the spoken part of the panel? What, what do you recall was your earliest? Got a bit of feedback coming out of that monitor. Over here. <laughs> that monitor over there? This one right here is real loud. And, uh, well, when we get ready, why don't you tell me, Johnny and, and everyone here, what is your first memory of hearing the harmonica? What is the first music that you ever said? What What is that instrument? i got to know about it. What kind of question is that? <laughs> I guess it was before I knew what my name was. I can't. I can't even think, Steve. Uh, I, I guess. Um, uh, I think um, you know there was one around the house or something. I don't really remember. You know, the first time I was moved by what it could do was uh, <clears throat> getting uh, forty blues. 45s out of my father's had jukebox that was all smashed up and it was in our basement and I stole records out of it. <laughs> it later turned into my amp. <laughs> which I uh, was probably about eight years old and I figured that if you cut the wires off where the, they go to the needle and you wire in a microphone and you press A2 <laughs> it, it, it was still the coolest amp I ever had in my life. I love it. Now the downside of that is everybody, if you want to play with all your little buddies in the neighborhood, they all have to come to your house because you can't bring your jukebox to their house. <laughs> so I always had to host the jam, which I would always take the record, uh, put on a Jimmy Reed record and, and let all the little kids try to play along with it, and then I would slowly turn it down until it was just them playing, and that's how I got my backup band. <laughs> I'm giving you inside information on how to get this shit accomplished. Because when you're a young kid, you don't know anything, and there's nobody to tell you, so you gotta figure it out for yourself. So that would have been, I don't know, I probably would have been, uh, um, uh, seven or eight years old and you know started really buying records and stuff by the time I was 12 and, uh, I think that answers the question <laughs> oh come on <laughs> thanks Johnny is there a song you'd like to play you want to play a song for everybody no <laughs> moving on <laughs> I, I can if that's what you want, but I thought this was the talking part. Well, we, we, you know, you can talk and then play, and then uh, yeah, move on. Just get it all yeah. <laughs> Jimmy says, Jimmy says, get it over with. <laughs> Plus, you got to go to the pool, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had instructed some people earlier uh, in some of my shows that if I if I go on late or I have to leave early, it's somebody else's fault. Uh, because they scheduled me 15 minutes between this show and another show. So when I get up and leave, ladies and gentlemen, it's only because someone made a mistake, not me. Uh, yeah, let's play uh, something in D minor.
sing a second verse because there's more guys on the stage that need to need time. So I thought maybe you want to take that into consideration as we travel on. I appreciate your yeah, yeah. astuteness. <laughs> now ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, his first time in Las Vegas, a dear friend of mine, a co-conspirator for a lot of years, and one of my favorite musicians, Paul Reddick. Hello. So Paul, you're not quite a traditionalist like some other harp players. You're, you're not one of the guys who does like, you know, Little Walter and Son of Boy Williams and all that stuff all the time. What, how would you describe your approach to playing the harmonica? Uh, I'm not very good at learning things, so I could never learn how to do it. So I did something else. That's it. <laughs> I've been around the bush, but uh, eventually, uh, I think it was like a, 
It's really like a learning disability, but I get to call it artist. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to just skip to the song? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, I'm going to do a song that uh, I wrote with a guy named Colin Linden. It's called Wishing Song. Thing. Oh man, what a story. Uh, 
My grandfather played the harp, even though he passed before I even got to meet him. And that was kind of sad, because I just heard it from my father. Yeah, your grandfather Fletcher, he played the French harp up in Birmingham, Alabama, where he came from. But uh, as a kid, listening to the radio down in Mobile, he had Slim Harpo, scratched my back. The Beatles even had harmonia. Love me do and stuff like yep. that. Man, that sounds pretty cool, you know. And uh, <clears throat> listen to a lot of records growing up. My, my dad was a good record collector, really, bringing home uh, all these 45s and stuff. But uh, I got a hold of Rolling Stones record kind of early on and, and started listening to. Uh, I think it was on Rolling Stones Now. I think that was the first album, one of them. And uh, I don't know, Mick Jagger was a big, big influence in a lot of ways. And the fact that Stones played a lot of blues songs and R&B stuff, and I'm going, well, I wonder who originally cut that. They didn't write it, so, you know, go finding out stuff like that. And uh, another part of it is learning to play the harp. <clears throat> I told my brother, my brother Jack's like two years older than me, and uh, about my 16th birthday, he said, what you want for your birthday, brother? I said, no. I think I want a harmonica, why don't you go, I, I would love traveling. So uh, he went to some, I don't know, music store, and he, he came back and he said, okay, happy birthday. And he gives me this box, and I open it up, and there's a chromatic harmonica sitting there looking at me, I'm going, Oh, that's a lot of holes there in a, in a button on the end. That's not one of those little ones. I'm gonna have to work on this one. You know, let me let me let me start a little slower than that. Now, I'm not no Johnny said Solomon said, you know. <laughs> I can play a little bit on one, but I said, I tell you what, brother, why don't you take this back, get some of that money back, and give me a couple of those small ones. And let me let me start a little bit slower. So he did that. Got me some marine bands. I think, I don't know what they cost back then, about 10 bucks maybe. I miss that. Me too. <laughs> Real bad. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> that Rolling Stones record, man, had a song called Little Red Rooster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, Mick Jagger playing the harp on it. And I just, uh, I just made my mind up then I was going to start learning how to play it. But learning it, you know, there was nobody that I knew in my circle or, or nearby that could teach me that, that was playing it. So I was listening to records and, you know, in the beginning, it's like, okay, well, here's a harp, you know. Okay, well, that don't sound like blues to me, you know. And then, and then figuring out, kind of on my own, say, well, let me try well, I can draw on it. And finding the blue notes, you know, just without knowing really a lot about it. And uh, learning some on my own, but then I, I'm moving forward in the story a little bit, having the, uh, the blessing and, and the opportunity to meet certain, certain people. I mean, I was like 20, 21 years old when uh, we started touring with the Almond Brothers and doing all this stuff with Wet Willie. So we're on the road maybe uh, 72 and uh, playing Winterland with uh, Van Morrison and Taj Mahal. And, and I'm chasing Taj Mahal. <laughs> Mr. Mahal! <laughs> I'm Jimmy Hall. And, uh, can you show me how to do that? And some of that, you know, uh, octave. Well, let me tell you about the tongue block. I mean, you can you can block the middle notes and he showed me a few things but along the way there was some guy that then ran into uh, John Hammond uh, Jr. and uh, and I said but show me how to blow that high note and make it work you know and so several great people along the way uh, gave me some tips and uh, and helped me along and I kind of figured out some of the rest of it but uh, I, I still love playing it and uh Glad to be here. <laughs> Let's not keep on rattling. No, it's a pleasure to have you here, Jimmy. Why don't you, why don't you show us some of what you figured out okay. along the way? Okay, we're going to do a, a little bit of...
a little Red Rooster for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Hey Steve, this is when I get to interview you. If you'd like to, by all means, Johnny, take it. All right, well I'll start by saying, Steve, you're... <laughs> you're still, to me, you're still that little kid I met with the, his father brought him to the blues jam. And, uh, and you were a little kid. I was a little kid. And, and uh, I was pretty amazed at how how quick you were learning and, and uh, this was in Ottawa, Canada and I wouldn't come back like once a year or something but um, every time I came back Steve was playing a new instrument. I don't know if you started on home harmonica? Harp was my first one. And every time I came back he was playing something else and I was like this is a whiz kid. I don't know what's going to happen to him because he's just got too much talent for this planet and we're going to have to like slap the kid down. So uh, my question for you, Steve, when you first got the harp and you were that kid, I won't ask you why you did it, maybe your father wanted you to do it or something, I hear that a lot these days, but if you can just like say, when was your first actual paying gig and where was that at and who was it with and, and what were you playing? Okay, very good question. Buried in there I want to address something, thankfully I didn't have the soccer parents who put me into music just to live out their dreams, you know what I mean? Uh, my folks were very supportive and they, they're really shy and they would always like linger in the back of all the bars that I played at and they were not the ones who were like, you should get my son up, you know, like, uh. So I'm thankful for that. But uh, uh, my first paying gig, I was 13. It was at the Ottawa Folk Festival in 1998. And on the stage was Tony D, uh, Sue Foley, Ray Bonneville, Larry Mootham, the guy that taught me to play harp, and a guitar player named Vince Halfide, and another one named Paul Fenton. And we, it was like a, a blues workshop at a folk festival, so I ended up playing a song or two, you know. But uh, what first got me into the instrument was uh, seeing the Blues Brothers movie when I was about 10 years old. And there's that scene in that film where they're down on Maxwell Street and John Lee Hooker and his band oh, yeah. playing, and uh, Big Walter Horton's playing harp on that. And I was, before I could hear it, I was like, that looks really cool. I got a mic just like yours. Smoke in the other hand. I'm like, all right, I, I want to know what that's about. And then I got the soundtrack, and kind of like Jimmy was saying, I, I recognized that all these people didn't write these songs on this Blues Brothers record, and I started doing my homework, learning about Chess Records and all the, you know, yeah. Muddy and Helen Wolf and Sonny Boy Williams and Little Walter. And um, one of the first... Uh, one of the first blues recordings I was ever given was the first Fabulous Thunderbirds record, Girls Go Wild. It's in fact self-titled, but there's a little thing that says Girls Go Wild, so everyone thinks that's what the title is, but it's, a, it's just the Fabulous Thunderbirds. And uh, Kim Wilson, uh, his tone on their version of She's Tough by Jerry McCain just ended everything for me. I was just like, okay, that's what I want to sound like. And so... Uh, I tried doing that for a while. I remember you following him around at the, uh, <laughs> the Ottawa Blues yeah. Fest. I have a good shot of the three of us still. I think it was like 20 years ago now. And Kim says to me, who's the kid? You didn't have the kid. That came next. <laughs> anyway, so, you know what? I, I guess I'll play a little something. One of the... After talking to guys like you and, and Kim and Rick Astrid and James Harmon, you know, there was a lot of talk about Little Walter. And uh, so I, I did that. I, I dug deep on Little Walter and I really got into all the songs and le tried to learn how to play them and stuff. And there's one that I still love to play to this day. If we could play a little bit, I would like to. Uh, it's an instrumental called Rocker. And what was interesting about Little Walter was that he had the sort of phrasing of a jazz saxophonist and really changed the way the harmonica was presented within blues music. And uh, you can hear it. it. A lot of his stuff is really up-tempo, swingy stuff. And he has this really interesting phrasing and his tone is always just so interesting. Uh, it would vary from very clean to really super overdriven, but very controlled. I always really dug that about what he did, so. 
And on a lot of those chess records, you hear slap back, delay, like, I'm going to turn mine up just a bit. You know, Steve, on that original version of that, I think that I think there was a broken speaker in there yeah. on that amp. I don't think it was, I, I don't think they wanted it to sound like that, but they just didn't care because it sounded so good. Yeah. <laughs> Happy accident. This, I think the same is true of Ike Turner's tone on right. Rocket 88, right? right? Fell off the back of the truck, and then yeah. that's how yeah. overdriven guitar became a thing. <laughs> with some local guys named the, the Johnny Russell Band, and, and they were like, we're gonna bring Jeff and Johnny Sansone from New Orleans. I was like, cool, they're like, you can't play the gig. I'm like, okay, well, but Johnny was nice enough to let me play a tune or two before he got up there, and, then, and that was uh, 25, 24 years ago, something like that, so he's been leading me astray ever since. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It, if, if you want to go, you're excused from class to make, to make your gig. You got time? Got, use. Could you play another one before you leave? Could you do, could you do that? I don't want to take Yeah, no, no, I would like you to play a song. I think everyone, everyone else wants to enjoy it.
being on this panel with these fantastic players. If you'd all like to see what it's like to play harmonica in 110 degree weather, come up to the pool after this. Yeah. <laughs> I thought perhaps I'd just stop and get some eggs and, and I could, you know, put them right here and I could have breakfast. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Thanks for coming out, my friend. Nice to see you. Indeed, after we're done going up to the pool and having dinner, we're going to Where else are you playing after that? Are you done for the weekend after that? Oh, no. I'm all over the place. Hey, Steve, what's all those gizmos back there? Is that what makes you sound so good? No. <laughs> In fact, uh, a guy we probably both know, is there's a, a guy from Lake Pontchartrain, who uh, makes these pedals named Randy Landry. His company is called Lone Wolf Blues Company. He makes effects for harmonicas and uh, harmonica players. And when we're traveling around and we don't know what amplifier we're going to use, I just use this one pedal called the Harp Octave that just gives it a little break up just to give me some consistency because you don't know sometimes what you're going to have to play through and how it's going to sound. So with that little thing, I can just get pretty much the same sound all the time. Yeah. So I do that. And uh, a delay pedal just to get that nice old tape echo kind of sound. And, uh, you know, speaking of pedals and effects and this and that. I think Paul, I'm going to tell Randy to make a Wonder Boy stomp pedal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you step on it, you sound like Steve. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. See, thank you, guys. Paul, would you, uh, you got anything to say? Well, I'd like to say that listening to Jimmy talk about his growing up learning to play, I, I think it's the same for most harmonic players that we, we kind of grow up in, in isolation with our records. There's usually, at least when I was young, no one was, I lived in the country, and no one played the harmonica, so you learn on your own and from albums. And I was lucky enough, uh, I got a harmonica when I was about 13. I was at a family Christmas party at my uncle's house. He was a bit of a ladies' man and a stoner. There was this little blue thing on the shelf, and I thought, it's either condoms or drugs. But it was a marine band. And, uh, How disappointing. I know. I, know. I could have had a different lifestyle. But I had aspired to what might have been in the uh, Anyway, it took me in. Then my brother's... Uh, they were going into the city to the big record store. I said, ask those guys to get some records for me, like buy some records they recommend for blues. And they gave me the best of Muddy Waters, best of Little Walter, best of Son of Williamson, best of Howlin' Wolf. And I'd never yeah. heard of any of them or had any context for listening to that. And I put those records on, I was just like, yeah. oh. <laughs> you know, and they've provided me and all of us with our life's uh, inspiration and so I began you know slowly planing away at trying to learn what they were doing and I always wondered why did they make the decisions to play what they did at any particular time like why did they do that and they each played so individually and uh, so I was more interested in trying to think what was the you know the vocabulary that they had inherited and the motivation for them to play what they play. Which made me kind of in, insecure for a long time because I was always thinking, you know, well, I don't know what they were doing and what am I doing? But eventually you realize that the, the secret is to not think about anything and just, you know. And, uh, but that's uh, the learning harmonica through records is a beautiful experience. And I wore out a lot of copies of those things. And you have to get a variable speed turntable because a lot of the records were out of tune. Mm. Anyway, I, I'm going to play a song and it's another one that I made up and uh, it's got, I'm going to play a low, uh, a low harmonica. Unfortunately, the harmonica part's at the end of the song, so you got to get through all these lyrics. Is it okay if I play that song? It's called Blue Wings. Well, little by little. 
some other songs but I just thought it might be appropriate we play one of one of his first hits so that's all right mom we'll be doing the key of C and just kind of group uh... he's so good Baby, any way you want to do, that's all right. 
that's uh, what, what's, 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 I can't even talk after that. Holy moly, man. That's the deepest group I've heard in, in a minute. <laughs> but I do want to thank everyone for joining us this early in the day. And, uh, a wonderful rhythm section. The band backing everybody up. Tony Dean on the guitar. Ethan Lowell on the drums. Mark Arabian on the bass. Thank you kindly. Um, my other good friend from Toronto, where I live, he yeah. <laughs> lives around the block from me, and we get in a lot of trouble a lot of the time. <laughs> my name's Steve Mariner. This is Paul Reddick. And, uh, I think How about for the host with the most today, y'all? Yeah. So the hats go. It's a uh, real pleasure to be on the stage with all these fellas and uh, in, in front of all of you. And uh, I have a long day. I have to, I do, I'm doing the tweener sets at the theater tonight, and then right here at 11 p.m., I believe it's the only show happening tonight, which is Monkey Junk from 11 to 12. So come on and party with us. After, the, after you get all ripped up by the queens, come over here and we'll try not to disappoint you. <laughs> so, uh, but we have time for one more song, and uh, one of my, a lot of my influences as a harmonica player are from people who are now dead. Uh, and unfortunately, this man is no different, but uh, he, it's Hello. too bad. <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite harmonica players to ever have lived uh, was from Portland, Oregon. His name was Paul DeLay. And uh, he uh, was one of the most musical and interesting harmonica players. And besides that, I loved his songs. I do love his songs still. And it, it, we're lucky that there's a legacy of great music to always go back to with Paul's. And, uh, this is a song of his that I like to play, and the groove we hit on just now made me think of this, so maybe we can pick it up again, and, uh... Oh, did you? Oh, awesome. Well, we're in, uh, the flat of B, if that's all right. B, B natural, then. No. B natural. Yeah, the flat of C. Okay. I'm just getting the group started, then I also want to play other. My favorite euphemism for the harmonica is the misery whistle song. Because <laughs> honest to God, there's no more lonesome sound than a harp when it's just right. And uh, thank you all very much for being with us this afternoon, and uh, let's do this one here. Thank you. Thank you. 